Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Rappaport to the rescue with award-winning animal advocate Jill Rappaport. Hi, welcome to Rappaport to the Rescue. I am Jill Rappaport and I am thrilled to be back after kind of a long hiatus. I must tell you there is a reason for this. My senior doxy, Oscar Meyer, you hear me talking about him on every show because he's usually the most vocal one in the background. Well, about five weeks ago, I came upstairs and he started walking towards me with one leg dragging off to the side. It is every pet owner's worst nightmare, especially with a dachshund, because everybody knows that in your lifetime, if you own one, most likely you're going to have back issues with them. Well, this dog is so incredible. He's going on 15, as I mentioned. He has never had an issue. I rescued him at eight years old, and he's the type of dog, his worst nightmare is being corralled or held. So all these years, even if I tried to hold him, to help him off the bed or get him down the stairs, he would not have any part of that. And I wanted him to live his best life. And he is Mr. Tuffy. And he's been going up and down stairs and jumping all over the place. And quite frankly, I have been truly blessed. So here, all of a sudden, he's dragging his back leg. He can't walk. And I knew exactly what it was. And I have to tell all of us pet owners out there, if you ever have a dog that is lame in the back, you cannot wait. Literally, it's a matter of 12 to 24 hours. If it is a disc issue, you could be looking at total paralysis or worse if you don't get them to an emergency room immediately. So this was my challenge. Oscar hates being picked up, so now I had to figure out a way to do that with a slip disc. And his next biggest fear, being put in a car. The last time he was in a car was eight years ago after I adopted him and I was getting him to the vet. Well, he would have no part of that. He literally jumped on the ground on the gas pedal. And thank goodness I was able to maneuver him and get my foot on the brake so we didn't go through my house. So now on this night, almost five weeks ago, I had to get him into a car and hold him. Imagine and all with a slip disc, and time is not on my side. We literally got to the emergency room. They determined it was a disc issue. Normally, they would rush him into surgery, but he's going on 15. He's not going under anesthesia. So they said, let's just pray for the best. You've got to treat him now like a Ming vase. Literally, for the next four to six weeks, he has to be in a crate, his third worst nightmare. And he can never... Oh, he's barking. He's agreeing. Thank you, Oscar. And he can never go up and down stairs again and can never jump off furniture. He's complaining right now. So I said, well, let's hope for the best. They gave him pain medicine and prednisone. The steroid is what has to get the inflammation down immediately. And like I said, you're running against the clock. And this doesn't just happen with dachshunds. Any small dog, any big dog. My coonhound has a back issue. He can't go upstairs. When you're running against the clock, anything with the disc, you must get that steroid or whatever your vet prescribes immediately into their system so that the inflammation goes down. So it does not destroy nerve cells, which can create paralysis or worse, travel up and then they can't breathe. And then sadly and tragically, they have to be euthanized. So I am here back on the air today. I am so thrilled to say that Oscar Meyer is doing great. He's back to lifting his leg when he does his business outside. (laughs) He is running and trotting and jumping around like a little madman. But again, I have to remember that this can happen in a nanosecond if I let him go back to his old ways. So I'm so thrilled to be back with Rappaport to the Rescue today, celebrating Oscar Mayer and his well-being, and to introduce you to my special guest today. This wonderful woman truly puts the A in animal advocacy. The one and only Katherine Heigl coming up. How many of you have pets? 
My hand's raised. Now think about how lucky you are to have such a sweet little pet in your life. And that pet is lucky to have you too. But unfortunately, there are countless pets out there that don't have a home to call their own. However, Bob's from Skechers is trying to change that. So we developed Bob's for dogs and cats to help pets in need. With every purchase of adorable Bob's footwear or fun, stylish apparel, or even the cutest Bob's pet accessories, Skechers makes a donation to Petco Love to help save shelter pets. And with your help, we've already saved the lives of over 1 million pets and raised over $7 million. So while you're getting style and comfort with features like Skechers' famous memory foam cushioning, you're also helping to save an adorable pet in need and helping another lucky owner be connected with a future best friend and companion. Because happiness is having a loving pet by your side. Find Bob's at a Skechers store, Skechers.com, select pet co-locations, or wherever stylish footwear is sold. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to Rappaport to the Rescue. I'm Jill Rappaport, and I am absolutely thrilled to have my next guest here today, who is not only an incredible Emmy Award-winning actor, but she has made it her mission to give back and raise awareness for those in dire need, whether on two or four legs. Katherine Heigl has devoted her life to animal welfare, and with her wonderful mother, Nancy, they created the Jason Debus Heigl Foundation in honor of her beloved late brother, helping to end animal cruelty and abuse, and celebrating kindness and compassion for our fur angels. She has gone on to create an incredible pet food business called Badlands Ranch, I love that name, and has just launched a store on Shopify called Artware, again, completely devoted and dedicated to helping animals in need. And did I also mention she is a mom of three and is also a strong proponent and powerful voice for human adoption, cancer-related issues and research, and organ donation. Please welcome superhuman, <laughs> Catherine Heigl. I am so excited to have you on Rappaport to the Rescue. Congratulations on all your amazing endeavors, especially for animal welfare. Well, thank you. I am so honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, I had mentioned in the intro, all your accolades, literally, it almost took up the whole show, everything you did. <laughs> But when I became a super fan, besides your incredible acting, was when I realized what a huge animal advocate you are and basically have been your whole life. Talk to me about what started you on this mission of the heart. You know, really, I, I have to give full credit to my mother, Nancy, who somebody recently asked me like, oh, because I grew up with a lot of pets and we always had a lot of animals around the house. And they said, well, were you the kid that always, you know, came home with a, you know, abandoned animal? I said, no, my mom was. <laughs> it was always my mother, you know, and she really instilled that in us, this compassion, this love, this appreciation for our companion pets. And then it was in 2008 that my mother really became aware of the problem in our country with the pet overpopulation and the abandonment and the shelters. And we had been rescuing animals for a while, but we didn't realize just the severity of it. So that's when we began the foundation to try to make a dent, try to make a difference. Um, And so I really have to credit Nancy with kind of steering that ship. And I get the great legacy now of being a part of something that really mattered because my mom, you know, started the ball rolling. And this foundation was named in honor of your beautiful and beloved late brother. Tell us about that. Well, I think, you know, it's funny because my mother and I were sort of joking about it (laughs) recently because I was like, why does he get all the credit? We're doing all the work. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yes, my brother was sort of exceptional. He was an exceptional young man. And I was only, I was almost eight when he died. And so I don't have a wealth of memories of him, but my mother obviously does and my father and my older siblings. And I get to hear those stories. And he was somebody who really fought for the underdog in every situation, in every way. He really had a big heart for for a kid who was only 15 years old. Most of us are really consumed with ourselves at that age and what other people think about us. But my brother cared a lot about those who were suffering, those in need. He wrote some beautiful poetry about the children dying and, you know, the animals being neglected. And so it was kind of, in, you know, it, it made sense to do this in his honor because 
it was so innately who he was and he didn't live long enough to create a legacy for himself. So my mother wanted to create this one for him. And sadly, tragically, he was killed in a car accident before his 16th birthday. And this foundation, which is truly a legacy for you and your family, it's amazing because you were so young still when you started it with your mother and you've done and you've gone on to create so much goodwill. And I'm all about the underdogs too. I'm all about the seniors, the special needs, and especially the pit bulls. I always you know, get so frustrated with people because we only hear the bad stories about pit bulls. And as you know, Catherine, it's a slang term. There's really no such thing as a pit bull. It's a bully breed. And I had an American bulldog, Petey, who I lost during COVID at 17. He was 120 pounds tied to a tree in Harlem, used as a bait dog. And I have to tell you of all my rescues, and I have three now, we lost three during COVID. He was my sweetest, kindest, my fur angel. And meanwhile, nobody would even look at him. He had one day to live when I rescued him because, oh, they thought he's a pit bull. It's so frustrating. And you've been such an important voice. And that's what really matters because of your fame and everything you've achieved an Emmy winner. Someone like you to speak out really reaches the masses. I hope so. I hope that there, you know, I hope that there's something I can do with this you know, this platform I've lucked into, quite frankly, that matters. And Petey sounds like my mom's Pico. She used to call him Pico, my guy And he was, you know, a big boy and a big pit. And he was the kindest, gentlest, most loyal. He was just an extraordinary dog and passed from cancer, which, you know, we see so much of that in our pets these days. But people just so misunderstand the nature of these animals. And it's so hard for me to put myself in the shoes of somebody who might misinterpret them because I just don't see it. I don't see it. Like, you know, the bully breed was bred to be nanny dogs in England. They laid under the cribs of the children to protect them. Helen Keller had. (laughs) Yes. Yes. You know, and it's like that, just like you said, that information is not widespread enough. What gets spread is you know, when there's one negative thing that happens, one instance, wildfire on the news. Right. And I just I hate that about our society. I hate that that's the kind of story that sells. I hate what it does to our animals. I hate the reputation it gives them. It's quite frankly, it's bullshit. It it, exactly. <laughs> it, it's bully shit, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, that's why 95% what's languishing in our shelters nationwide are the bully breeds because of this misconception. And we're not making light or passing over the tragedies that have happened. But I always say it's not about the animal. It's the hands that they end up in because usually through their handler, you know, you never know what can happen. And if you give them a second chance at a new life, I can tell you, Petey was never given that chance until I came along and the biggest fur angel. So I'm so glad that you stand for that. And I love that your foundation, you had one of your campaigns was I hate balls. (laughs) I know I forgot about that. It was so long ago, but yeah. Obviously to support neuter and spay. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And my husband was such a good sport about that (laughs) because he made a little (laughs) appearance. Um, But yeah, that was really fun. And I thought a really clever way to kind of spread the word and not such a sad and heartbreaking way as some of our, you know, sort of messaging out there about how to help these animals kind of tends to take that tragic route. And so we decided to take this kind of funny tongue in cheek route. And it was fun. It was a fun project to be a part of. I'm glad your husband understood, although I could yeah. probably apply it to animals <laughs> and men, but, that- <laughs> some, but you know, some, it's just right? amazing what you've done with this foundation. Then you've gone on to create this incredible dog food, Badlands Ranch. My ranch is called the last buck ranch because it literally was oh. my last buck. Oh, that's to, genius. To have my I horse love that. Ranch. But I love it. It's such a badass title. It's so great. I love it. The name. Tell me about this whole line and what you've created. Well, it was really like one of those sort of fortuitous moments. And sorry, I've got one guy who just needs to be loved all the time. (laughs) This is when I wish our listeners could see this. Tell me about the little angel in your lap right now. Not to interrupt your other. We'll we'll get back to the dog food. We'll get back to it. This is Waffles. And he is a true Waffles. My daughter named him. He's um, a true lover, for sure. He just needs to be loved all the time. He looks like a teddy bear. I know, doesn't he? He's too cute. He's the cutest. But Uh, um, he's like a little Pomeranian that we rescued up here in Utah, surprisingly. Why are are there Pomeranians in Utah? But (laughs) 
where are you? and he is uh he's he's great with the kids which is really because i have eight dogs and i was all gonna of them say love the children he's one of eight <laughs> and three human children <laughs> yes right and then there's the three humans and this one like of course the kids love because he's like a little stuffed animal and then i have two sort of shepherd maybe lab mixes that i rescued when they were about three months they were abandoned and a trailer park in Los Angeles, but they're very feral and have remained so. They're almost probably 13 years old now, but they never really got over that. So they're okay with me, but they're not. They, the kids kind of scare them. Other adults scare them. So they're not like the kind of dogs my kids can play and love on. Yeah. And then we have a silly boxer, <laughs> Bubba, who was uh, a backyard breeding situation and the mother died and all the puppies were going to die and sort of foundation pulled them and got them into fosters to be bottle fed and the whole thing and he ended up with us and he's a good family dog but very rambunctious so maybe a little much for like the smaller children and then I just rescued two uh, Roddy puppies that oh. had parvo and were again I think a backyard breeding situation where the litter got sick whoever was breeding them dumped them at the shelter to die because the shelter is not going to treat parvo they, they can't they don't have the means or the staff to do that the rest of the litter died. We got the two left out to the vet. They got through it. And then we got them up here to Utah where we were going to get them adopted. But I felt they needed fostering and more. Extra, they were still extra pretty health. sick. Yeah. yeah. So I brought them home and started fostering them back to health. And then, you know, like. Foster fail. Foster fail. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have my heart and soul in getting these dogs better. And they're so attached to me. And I'm so attached to them. And foster fail. But the yep. kid, they're great, great with the kids like they're the perfect family dogs they're just so lovey and sweet and oh and them. your husband sounds like a true angel he obviously supports <laughs> your passion for all of these amazing animals right and he them. has come to now we've been together well we've been together 17 years and married for 15 so it you know has been a slow dawning that this is the rest of his <laughs> life <laughs> with me at least and I think initially, I remember we were engaged when I was doing 27 dresses and I didn't have the foundation yet. I didn't know how big the problem was yet, but I still, you know, was really passionate about rescue and about animals. And we were working in a diner in Rhode Island and often they like set design will put up props like posters or this or that to make it look like a real diner. It was a real diner, but I didn't know if the poster I saw as I walked in was set design and props or if it was true and real and I asked them they said no that's real and it was a notice that a woman had to relinquish her 12 year old German shepherd because she was moving couldn't take him with her and if she couldn't find someone to rescue him she was going to take him to the shelter or not to the shelter to the vet and put him down so that at least she was with him and I couldn't bear it I just couldn't bear it and so I called and I said I will take this dog and it was such a heartbreaking story. And it was so, oh man, to this day, it just kills me. His name was Mojo and her son was disabled and they came to set to leave me this dog and he to go in my trailer while I was working. And this dog was so attached to her son, so attached to her. And it was a situation where she was moving in with her daughters and couldn't take him because there was a no pet policy. Her son couldn't take him because of his, where he lived in a disabled living home. And this dog they cried and cried saying goodbye to this dog. And then he cried and cried and cried in my trailer uh, for hours. It was awful. But but look at the bright side. It ended up, that dog ended up with you. Talk about did. hitting the doggy lotto. What could have happened? He did. He had a couple of years with us before he passed. And that was when Josh realized because he was really against it, you know, and I freaked out <laughs> and I just started <laughs> sobbing and crying and go how could you be so callous how could you not care maybe we shouldn't get married you don't understand me at all and so that's when it began where he started to come like oh god what am I getting into with this girl <laughs> but um <laughs> I love that so, story did you keep in touch with the owner and the son to let so him know we how did Good. We did. And so I worked back. So that was in Rhode Island. And then several years later, I was working in Connecticut and Mojo was not long for the world. And so they flew me, and this was in like the highlight days, uh, they flew me privately to Connecticut and I was able to bring him with me oh. so that they could come and say goodbye. And they came to the house that I was renting at the time and they got to spend the afternoon with him and say goodbye because that was the last time that they would see him. Sorry. Hey! 
Oh, are you kidding? Uh, any minute, my doxy, Oscar Meyer, is going to be chiming in. So don't you worry. That That's is such, such a, a beautiful name. story. And again, exemplifies the human being you are, which is why I so respect and admire you, Catherine. You're truly amazing. You. We started to talk about your dog food. In a minute, we're going to get to that. But you mentioned Utah. I know you were very involved recently with trying to ban the gas chambers with HSUS. Yes. We My succeeded. friend works there. She's one of the directors, the Utah director. And she oh, great. idolize you. They said, oh, my goodness, that Catherine Heigl is amazing. Oh. You put your voice out there. You went, you tried to help, and you made a difference. You know, for me, it's a matter of sleeping at night. It's just like if I can be there, if I can get myself there, and I can be of any help and be part of any kind of solution, then I'm going to go because I, I wouldn't be able to live with myself otherwise. And this is one of those things that I think everybody here in the animal advocacy world in Utah has been fighting and fighting for years. And, you know, it just felt like, okay, if I can help make any difference in getting this damn thing passed, I will go. And everybody involved was incredible. The governor, the senator we worked with, everybody was just instrumental in getting this through. And I'm so relieved that we did because I, I, like I said to them, when I spoke with them at the Capitol, we're too good for this. Exactly. Utah's too good for this. You know, this is a sacred place. This is this land and the creatures here and the people here, this is a sacred place and we need to treat it as such. And this is barbaric. This is torture. This yes. is torture. We're torturing animals. And one of the last States to have this ridiculous yeah horrific right. situation. And it's like, don't be the last one to say no. Don't let us carry that legacy. So I'm just so grateful it went through and for everybody involved in getting it through. And, you know, now it's on to the next fight. <laughs> <laughs> and sadly, it never ends. But the only good side end. is people like you are out there fighting. And with Badlands Ranch, which again, I just adore the name, it would seem like the natural next step, but creating a dog food. I know that um, I had dog biscuits at one time. I have dog toys. I have collars, leashes. But anytime you're dealing with an ingestible, there's a big responsibility. God forbid, yeah. you know? Yeah. And what were you thinking when you created it? And tell me how it's going with this wonderful dog food that gets just huge rave reviews. Oh, God, I love hearing that. Yeah, I'm really proud of it. And it was just like you're saying, it was kind of complicated. I wasn't sure I wanted to get involved. One, because I felt like what value can I add to this particular market? There's so much out there. It's already confusing enough in the dog food aisle. Like, you know, why do I want to just throw my name on something and add more confusion to the <laughs> to the aisle? And so as we continue talking, this company that approached me to partner, and I said, look, I'd be more interested if I could incorporate some of my other passions, which is holistic wellness and plant medicine and kind of taking that naturopathic and being very clean and clear about our ingredients and just making it really like a simple solution for people who do care about whether this food is tested on animals. And I know that that sounds weird. Like, what do you mean test on animals? Like, yes, they test the food on animals that are test animals, meaning they've been bred to be created and tested on for their entire lives. Right. Even if it's just that you're testing food, they don't live a proper animal life. And you'd be shocked at how many food brands use test animals. Like look at those poor beagles, hundreds of right. beagles. Thank goodness. Hundreds in of beagles. Made some hundreds. a difference for them. Exactly. And, you know, we tested it on our animals. <laughs> you know, that was like, and so there's just one simple thing that you can trust about the food. Family and then on tested. Top of that, family tested and approved. And and then this sort of holistic side of it that I'm really proud of, and I do believe adds a value to that space that isn't there. And I have seen incredible benefits with my pets. I've been feeding it to them for months, and I'm really seeing significant health improvements in weight. I've have struggled with weight, like my big dogs get big quick, even when I'm feeding the right portions, even when I'm doing this, and I'm doing that and trying this food, and trying that food, I was they were getting fat. And now they're back at like a proper weight, their energy levels have improved their older dogs. Now that I'm seeing some real improvement in joint health for those older shepherds. So important. Yeah, so important. I mean, I had to let go of, one of a beloved dog, not because her mind or her heart or her organs, because she couldn't stand anymore. 
you know, you and that's create just, this line for humans. Oh, Come on. <laughs> I know. I asked them that. I was like, because we have a new supplement that we do for um, that you can add to the dog food. Or if you can't get the dog food, you can add to whatever food you're feeding to add that some of these natural holistic remedies. And I said, can I put this in my water? Like this has everything in it that I take like individually here or there with this pill, that pill and this powder. And they're like, you can, it's going to taste like bacon. <laughs> Cause it's like <laughs> bacon flavored. And I went, forget it. <laughs> I'll, I'll find it. a human one. <laughs> no, but that's really impressive because you used your own fur children to test the brand on and you see that they're thriving. And I have to tell you, friends of mine that only give your dog food to their children, that's their children, swear <laughs> by it. They say that they've seen a tremendous difference, not only in, you know, the fact that they're moving better, their weight is better, their coats are shinier. Like everything yeah. about the animals seems to really improve on Badlands Ranch. I love it. And it's really interesting to me because it's simple. These are simple ingredients and it's, we try to keep it minimal, right? Minimal ingredients, but clean and pure and simple and what, you know, your dog would really be eating if it were still in the wild, like the organ meats and things like that. And I just think, my God, like we have really, you know, society has really muddied this water and yeah. created such a level of unhealth in our little creatures that depend on us by adding so much crap they don't need, so much garbage to entice them to eat something they wouldn't normally eat. Like, and some of the factories are that? dirty. They found rat oh, hairs in dog food. You just don't know what you're feeding because they're treating the animals like. They're second class, like they don't care, you yes. know, they're using byproduct, which is like beaks and bones and claws. And, oh. you know, and when you see that on the package of your dog food and it says, you know, chicken meal or yeah. beef meal, that's translation that crap, crap, you know, and I just, it's such a disservice to our pets. It's such a disservice to us as the parents who love them, who don't realize what they're doing, you know? So I'm just, it was really important to me to be honest, have clean ingredients and to incorporate the holistic aspect so that, you know, I do it in my life. I do it for my children, like for my pets, you know? And so it was great to find out that I could, first of all, and I can utilize lemon balm for anxiety. I can incorporate flaxseed for gut health, like neat. <laughs> Fantastic. And then it's not like you didn't have enough on your animal welfare plate. You now have a store on Shopify. This I is know. so exciting. Tell me all about this. This was really, a, you know, kind of new year, new me, <laughs> like an instance where I think, yeah, it was probably around January, February that I started feeling called to kind of put my art out there to be brave, you know, win or fail to just do it already. I've been really invested in creating art for about six years now. Through the pandemic, I started pushing even further forward with new programs like Procreate and taking a ton of art courses. And here I, I have all this art that I just was sitting on and doing nothing with. And because I wasn't brave enough to put it out there, I was just, you know, I kind of just kept saying, it's just for me. It's just for me. It's just how I unwind. It's just how I decompress. It's just, you know, a hobby. And my husband was really like, you need to start putting it out there. And I, then I saw this TikTok video about how easy it is to create your own Shopify store. I have one, but I can't figure out how to, you know, go through the orders and make sure I'm sending them timely and everything's working out. I'm not good with minutia. I'm creative. Right. I'm just terrible with, you know, putting the orders through and making sure everybody's got it in a timely fashion. Like the business aspect. Yeah. That's, oh. I, I'm a little hung up on that right now. And I just watched another TikTok video where they said, you, oh God, how did they say it? But basically what you believe about yourself is the reality you're creating. So the more oh. I tell myself that I'm not a businesswoman and I'm a creative, oh, the less able I am to do the business angle. So I'm really okay. trying to retrain the way I think. Because yeah, brilliant that, I did this. Women. <laughs> right, brilliant. Nobody's better. Maybe Steve Jobs. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized though, like, okay, here I did this. I, I went, I can do this on my own. I don't need to partner with anybody. I don't need to get somebody to back me. I don't need to pay someone to create it. I'll do it. And I do have, I have a wonderful webmaster I've worked with literally since like Roswell days. Wow. Yeah. He's like family now. And he's in London though. That's the only problem. And my mom and my you know management team obviously had input and some ideas and how I could get it going, but I get it out there. I get brave. I put the designs out there and then it's like, now what? <laughs> 
<laughs> now what do I do? <laughs> so now it's like I have this renewed passion to push forward and keep it going. And for me, the impetus to do it was really the animals. Like, I don't know that I would have put my art out there to sell for my own sake. It would never have felt significant enough or important enough to me. But to do it, to get brave, to do it for the animals, I felt like I right. could do that. And it's called artware. Yeah. I That's felt like what was clever. <laughs> <laughs> I love that title. And the fact that, again, it goes back to giving and benefiting animals in need. So people are not only getting a Katherine Heigl original, a beautiful piece of art, they're also saving a life, helping to save a life. I felt like if I can give something to people of value to them, that can then be a true value to the foundation, win-win, right? It, exactly. I, it has always been very hard for me to ask people to donate. My mother and I have funded the foundation ourselves all this time. And my mother just put in a million and a half dollars last year alone. No, I'm sorry, this year, so far, since January, to saving unbelievable. animals. It is unbelievable. And her accountant is like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Nancy, you could live another 20 years. And she's like, I don't care. I don't want to take anything with me. You know, <laughs> but, uh, And I'm not leaving any of these assholes a dime. My um, father so always <laughs> used to say that you never see a hearse with a U-Haul, right? right? Oh, my God, that's genius. And I'm writing it down. <laughs> I'm going, And I will give your father credit. But that's my, exactly my father, right. Yes. Yeah, pass, but your mother is, bless her heart, because... Just yeah. like her, it's my oxygen. I understand. Yeah. I get yes. it. It is her oxygen and it is her purpose and it is what drives her every day. And it was funny. She said to me yesterday, well, I just spent six hours trying to get this one little dog out of the shelter. And I don't, it wasn't a little dog. I'm sorry. It was a pit that they were going to put down because he snapped in fear, you know, snapped. He didn't bite anybody. He didn't hurt anybody. He just in the shelter, you know, and so they were just going to, boom, gone, Apple Valley. No. And she was trying like hell to get him out. His name was Gus. And I said, well, mom, it, you know, it was time well spent. It's not like you were wasting six hours of your day, you know, watching some garbage TV show or something. You were trying to save a life. So she, it is her purpose. And she clearly has passed on that purpose, that mission, giving back onto you. And, you know, yeah. for our listeners, they should understand also all of the other organizations and the things you do to help humans. You're very <laughs> pro speaking out to educate people about the joys of adoption, organ transplant, a cancer research. You're involved with so many things that have passion and meaning to your life. In well, that's right. Animal welfare. Every one of these things, every one of those particular issues has been a part of my life. So it wasn't about sort of like throwing my name on a cause and though that there's nothing wrong with that. And there's any little bit anybody can do for anything matters. But for me, each one of those things speaks to my life. Adoption has been a part of my life since I was born. My sister is Korean and my big sister and my favorite person in the world. And of course, my daughters are adopted in her honor. And because children are a massive passion of mine, as just like the animals, any voiceless, innocent being, I will stand for and I will defend and I will support. So that is important to me. The organ donation, of course, with my brother, and it was a decision my parents had to make at the worst moment of their lives. And it's a very hard decision to make in that moment. It's much easier to make it when you're getting your driver's license, you know? And so I really, really try to encourage people to do it then. Don't leave it to for your loved ones to have to figure out on your behalf and while they're letting you go. But my parents are incredibly brave, incredibly decent, good people. And they knew it was what my brother would have wanted. And, and it's important for us in a way to speak from it from the other side of organ donation, because a lot of people who speak for it are those who have received or need to receive an organ. So I always felt like it was really powerful of my mother to kind of speak from the perspective of the one who had to give, you know, yes. make that choice. And your mother is a cancer survivor, which is so incredible and wonderful. And that's obviously why you care so deeply about cancer research and education. I do. And why I'm so passionate about holistic wellness, because that's when it began for me. My mother was, I was 16 years old and she was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer and it was not looking good. She, you know, unless she had a lumpectomy, they checked the lymph nodes. It was not looking good. Oh. And so my mother chose the sort of extreme route. They said, well, we can do a further lumpectomy and radiation or we can just cut it all out and, you know, do a mastectomy and the nine months of chemo and it'll be rough 
but you have a higher rate of survival. And so she went that route. She Thank goodness. Never, yeah. And she never approached it from a place of like, I'm dying or, I, or maybe I'm dying. She did all the, the things and she speaks. And this is why, you know, I find it so obviously I really have a lot of respect for my mother. She also drives me insane. So don't, you know. <laughs> She's not a saint, but she is pretty <laughs> remarkable in many ways. And she speaks to a lot of women who get that diagnosis and tells them and a lot of her, you know, older women too, who are getting that diagnosis and tells them what she did. And she listened to the Bernie Siegels. She read those books about where your thoughts go with all of this. She listened to guidance that she sort of got from the universe about how to take care of herself during that time. She did the chemo, but she also did the naturopathy and she survived. She's almost 80 years old and every other woman in her breast cancer group has passed (gasps) and passed not long after their diagnosis. And I think, you know, as much as I, I get a little conspiracy theory about the whole pharmaceutical research angle of cancer. But I think the more we can take control of our own health and not leave it completely in the hands of our doctors, but not eschew their good advice and their education and their science and their minds. It's not choosing one or the other. It's combining both and taking some control over where your thoughts go and where your head is headed. And how are you going to go through this experience with a passion to survive versus a fear of dying? You know, unbelievable. And your mother is truly an inspiration to she anybody. She listening. should write a book. <laughs> oh, I mean, seriously. And I think it was because the animals, our little creatures on the planet needed her here too much to I save so them. Too. I really do. She had a, she had an additional calling that we I were agree. not going to let her go. And what an inspiration. But I have to tell you, Catherine, blown away. I've always, as I mentioned in the beginning, been a huge fan, but you have just taken on and made it your life's mission to help and raise awareness for so many important causes on top of being a mom of three and a wife and everything you've got going on and have this great acting career. Is that even a priority for you anymore, acting? That's a tough question because I know what I'm supposed to say. Right. But my truth is that no, it's not. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but mostly it's because I've been doing it my whole life since I was a child and it has been an incredible ride. And like I said earlier, I really lucked in to a platform and a kind of success. I don't know that I could have ever imagined for myself. I maybe at you know 16 had big dreams. This was my big dream at 16 to be enough of a success that I had a convertible and lived in LA and drove <laughs> around in my convertible on like Mulholland, right? Like With that the blonde was my, hair blowing in right, the wind. Right, right, right. Maybe it's like a scarf turn, you know, <laughs> very Hollywood. Like yeah. that was sort of as big as my dream got. And then suddenly my dream became so much more. It, the reality became so much more. And I kind of feel like I did it. You know, I did it and it was extraordinary and it was hard and it was heartbreaking and it was rewarding and it was defining in so many ways. But in my 40s now, first of all, things change as you age, of course, in Hollywood. It just does. I'd love to say it doesn't, but it just does. And there's this big part of me that's okay with that because I've had such a great run and I feel like there are these passions in my life I haven't gotten to really dive into or explore or put the time and energy into because, you know, you only have so much time in a day. And a big part of that is my family. You know, this is the way things, you know, obviously slowed down during the pandemic. And it was the first full year I had had off of work since I was 16 and my mother had cancer because we couldn't travel because she had to do the chemo. So it was the first year in 30 years, however many. Yeah. And I went like, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, I mean, and not that sounds insensitive. It was not an awesome time in the world, but there was this silver lining for me. And and you live away from Tinseltown. You live away I from do. all that limelight in Utah. You've got a ranch yeah. with your animals. You've chosen a different life. Yeah, I've chosen a different life. And I initially chose it for my children. And we've talked about that because Maylee is Korean and Adelaide is biracial. And it's a little complicated for them up here. This is not a lot of diversity, uh, you know, in the ranch lands of Utah. But I said to them, listen, guys, I know that that's hard for you. And I know that that can be complicated. And the blessing is that you often get to travel with me for work and to cities and into culture and into places where there is far more diversity. So you see what 
the rest of the world looks like more than you would if, if you weren't traveling with me. But the trade off for your mother and just know that your mother needed this is that I know you're living a quieter, safer, more private life. And I couldn't guarantee you that in LA. And I certainly couldn't guarantee it for myself. And there's an energy and spirit to Los Angeles that some people thrive on. But I I just didn't. It was too overwhelming and too hyper focused on my work and being what I was supposed to be and not just being present, figuring out who I actually am, and what I actually care about and what I want to give my time and energy to. And that year was a real eye opener for me. And I have really embraced slowing down. And it's hard, you feel as an actor, you are perpetually out of work. (laughs) That's the nature of the job is, you know, once one job ends, you're looking for the next one. So it's this mindset that's difficult to shut off and say, it's okay. It's okay that I don't have another job on the horizon just this moment. But I don't think this is over. I'm telling you, I, like I mentioned, you know, (laughs) knocked up at your fans out there. You're such a great actor. You really have such a great presence, but I can also see you hosting your own talk show. I mean, really, oh my I, God. Think, I think you'd I be need great Nancy that. for that. <laughs> oh, no, I think <laughs> I you would be <laughs> fabulous at that. But, you know, you are always known as beautiful and brainy. I remember back in the day. Oh, really? I um, never thought anybody thought I was very smart. Oh, no, no. I always <laughs> thought of you as being very smart. But I think your fans, you know, y- you have a huge legion of fans that love what you've done. And I don't think it's over. Now, it's up to you to decide for sure. But I think there's going to be interesting things coming your way. And then, of course, you'll decide. But you know what? You're still, I mean, compared to me, I think of you as very, very young. And I think that (laughs) you could do whatever you want. You know, it's just amazing to me that you kind of shucked it all aside and said, this is my focus right now. And it really is all about giving back to these very, very important heartfelt causes and to your family. I mean, it's the ultimate unselfishness you know, of just making it all about everybody else. Well, thank you. That's very gracious. It's not entirely that unselfish. Um, (laughs) I I get a lot out of it myself. But I do think that I saw this really beautiful interview. I really like TikTok. I'm not going to lie. But if they ban it, I'm going to be really mad. (laughs) I get like all my information, news and interesting entertainment out of it. But I saw this beautiful interview with Audrey Hepburn. uh, It was with Barbara Walters. And she was asking her, you know, why did you take basically this 10 year break from Hollywood? You know, what were you doing? And she said, along the lines of, you know, I wanted to be a mother so badly. And then I was never there. You know, he'd be sick, and I'd be miles away on set, and there would be nothing I could do. And she said, I made a choice, you know, that I wanted to be part of raising my child. And that was sort of my eye opener that year during COVID was, I'm never here. I I just get snippets. I come and I go, I come and I go. And there's no established routine. There's no mom routine with them. They know I love them. I try to bring them with me as much as I can. But again, they're in whatever apartment, condo or rental house, and I'm at work. Like, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure a lot of men have this issue when they are off to work themselves, their, you know, job all day and come home only get to see their kids on weekends and evenings. It's difficult. It's hard to not be a part of all of it. And it's equally difficult to be a part of all of it. But I just am really, I just feel now that I don't want to miss these years. I've missed a lot of Halloweens with them, getting to take them trick-or-treating when they were little. And I've missed a lot of birthdays where I'm on FaceTime and wishing them happy birthday and singing the song over a phone. I didn't want to miss anymore. I just wanted to be present. So I did it more for me than them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I just needed it to fill my heart. But ultimately, sure, it you know. was for them. And you now have been well, able I to hope, achieve this. I hope. I hope I'm not like paying for all their therapy in like 10 years. <laughs> and they're all like, she was such a taskmaster. She was so strict. <laughs> well, Catherine, I have to tell you, this has been such a joy. You are everything and more that I thought you would be. And I'm so excited about your new Shopify store. Let's remind our listeners again, yeah. it's artware and all for a great cause, the ultimate creativity. And I really support and just admire everything you've done and continue well, great you. work. And vice versa. I am so honored to be here with you. Thank you. This was a great, fun conversation. You made this so fun. So thank you for having me and giving me an opportunity to just push it all out there, all these things that matter to me. 
Oh, well, it matter to me and our listeners on Rappaport yes. to Rescue. Everything you talked about is what this whole show is about. And I love spending time with the kindred spirit. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And again, this was just fabulous. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today to Rappaport to the Rescue. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.